Good afternoon, Strange Loop. Um, so, to start with, I want to get you to do something. I want you to imagine a text string of a billion uppercase Gs. Right? So it's just GGGD extending as far as the eye can see. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is that there's a little bit of a paradox about this. So that's quite a large piece of data. Um, if it was one byte a character, I guess we're talking about a, a petabyte, uh, something like that. But I was able to describe it to you in under 10 words, probably about three seconds. So there's something odd about this. It's a massive piece of data, but I was able to explain it to you as an audience in a way that you could understand. And so it's this dichotomy between the brevity of description for something and the size of the end result that's what I want to talk about today. So specifically, I want to talk about Kamogorev complexity, which is the notion that the inherent complexity of a given piece of data is how long the shortest program you can write to make it is. So in the case of the Gs, I could write a very short expression to, to make that happen, and I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. There are other strings that are random. You can't find a way to shorten them. In fact, a definition of randomness under uh, the Kalmogorov complexity model is something that can't be described any shorter than just literally saying what it is. Um, so in order to talk about this, I'm going to use closure. Um, and there's a couple of good reasons for it. One is that uh, closure has overtone. So I'm going to be able to bring my musical examples to life so you can hear them and understand what I mean. The other reason is macros. So what Lisps do is that they allow you to talk about programs at two levels. Uh, at the level of the, the result, but also the level of the, the program itself. And that's very useful because that's what Kalmogorov complexity is all about, viewing a program both as a description and as a result. Uh, so this picture is Drawing Hands by M.C. Escher, which was used by Fogus in his talk, uh, The Macronomicon, which is a very good reference for, for macros. But I'll just give a, a brief introduction to the, the general mechanics of the, the technology I'm using. So you've probably seen this before. So uh, if I put a function and arguments like that, I can evaluate them in my editor. The key thing that makes a lisp a lisp is, of course, the fact that uh, the function comes first. Um, not, not too complicated. But the other thing that makes lisp lisp is that you can fix that if you want, or you can change things. So um, if I wanted to use infix notation, because it's more normal to me, um, I could write a macro to do so. Uh, so it takes A, F, B, A and B are the arguments. Um, and it outputs in the order that Lisp expects it. So if I define that, then I have the power to write programs in that other style. So instead of having the plus at the beginning, I can put it in the middle. So first of all, what I've done um, is to just evaluate the macro itself. So hopefully you can see down the bottom, it's now rearranged to plus four, five. Uh, and then if I evaluate it completely, it comes to nine. So what I've done is I've written something that is manipulating not the end result, not the, not the, uh, the evaluated symbols, but the raw symbols themselves. And so that ability to write code that talks about actual code is going to be really handy when I'm talking about the difference between descriptions and the results. So if we think about that string of Gs, I don't want to actually evaluate it because obviously if it is, you know, if it is a, a petabyte, that's going to be something that, that crashes my REPL. Uh, but Clojure has lazy sequences, so I can just uh, evaluate it and then take the first number of items. So there it is. There's that, that string. And you can see that it, it's not random. It has a pattern to it, a very trivial pattern. G is repeating. And that's why I can write this little bit of code here that defines the string itself. That's enough code when I evaluate it to generate that whole string. So I can say that it doesn't have very much inherent complexity relative to the language I'm using to express it. So as a side note, uh, the Kamelgrove complexity model talks about expressing programs in some kind of universal language that you can, you can measure. Uh, the choice of which universal language and what kind of features it has does present differences in what your results is. Uh, I'm not really going to go into that right now, but it is an interesting area of it. 
So if we just consider that I want to figure out what the description length of a, an expression is, like how long it takes to type it, I can write a macro to do that because a macro operates at the level of the program, not the level of the result. So this, this macro description length takes an expression, it gets the raw expression, just the symbols, um, it converts it into a string, and then it just counts how many characters there are. So it gives it a score of how long is that expression. There's a very nice symmetry between that and the result length. So what the result length does is it's exactly the same, but it's not a macro. So it's operating on the evaluated argument. So when I get the expression, it's, it's evaluated to whatever it should be, and I do the same process of converting it to a string and then counting it. So this is a unit test here that shows that the description length of this little expression is 13. So that's the string. It's, um, it's just a bunch of Gs, 65 Gs. Uh, but in order to describe it, I only need 13 characters. On the flip side, if I supply the same expression into result length, I get 131. And that's because the result, when I print it out, takes that many more characters uh, to represent. So there is this dichotomy between a concise description and an expanded result. One of the reasons that is, this is interesting is it's a, a generalized idea of compression. So whenever you're compressing any kind of file, you're doing this kind of thing. So you might not be deliberately thinking about writing a structured program to output the data, but what the compression algorithm is actually doing is exploiting its understanding of what kind of file there is. So if you have a PNG, it's exploiting the fact that it understands that PNG are made out of flat spaces of color. If you've got a text compression algorithm, it's exploiting its understanding that words repeat and characters repeat. So there's a very close relationship between the concept of expressing something concisely and understanding it, because only if you can uh, have a view of the internal structure of a piece of data can you express it concisely. So you could even say that the randomness of something is the ratio between its description length and its result length. So how much can you compress it? Basically a compression ratio. Um, so if I take that string of 65 Gs, you could say that its randomness is you know, about 10%. Now anything that you can't compress at all, uncompressible, I guess you could say is not random. One slight complication though is that working out the most concise way to express a particular value isn't decidable. So of this I have a, a truly marvelous proof that this talk is too small to contain. Uh, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll find it quite interesting. Um, so that's, that's the string of Gs that, um, that I wanted to talk about. But there's kind of another kind. So this is a, a Bach's air on the G string. Right? So it's also data. That's traditional musical notation. But you could view it as a sequence of points on a graph, right? So as you read the dots, where they are vertically tells you how high the note is, where they are horizontally tells you what the time is. There's a little bit, obviously, of extra flourishes, but for the point of my model, that will do. So they're just a sequence of points on a plane. So I can model this like I can model any other kind of data in code. And so I could, for example, instead of outputting a billion text Gs, I could output a representation of a billion notes of G and I could apply the same uh, kind of philosophy that I can work out how much I understand the structure of it, but how briefly I can describe it. So here's a little bit of an example just to show you what I mean. So hopefully you can see on the screen there, it's uh, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, the children's melody, expressed as closure data structures. Um, so hopefully it's broken up in a way that's comprehensible to humans. Um, and in the end, what it results in, I'll just show you, is kind of a bunch of stuff that's a lot harder to understand. It's just a big pile of result. Uh, it's actually OK that that's hard to understand, because that makes the point, that by describing it in a brief way, I've actually exploited its structure and been able to represent the meaning of the music. Um, so for example, there's a bit in the merrily, merrily, merrily bit where it actually repeats a note of a third length 12 times. I could have written that out by hand, but because I understand that that whole section has these small notes, I can describe it in a more brief way, which also uh, shows my understanding. 
Um, what's more, um, row, row, row your boat is something called a cannon. So a cannon is a special piece of music that serves as its own accompaniment. So you play it once, you functionally transform it, and then you overlay the second time. So I won't rely on you having to visualize or oralize that. I'll, I'll play that to you now. So what you should hear is row, row, row your boat, and you should hear the two distinct times that the melody happens. And because I understand that structure, it's not just a random collection of notes, I have this single line here called canon, which describes that duplication process. So I've been able to write it much more briefly because of that. Um, and so if I look at the, the uh, description length of Row, Row, Row Your Boat, it is what, 275. Uh, but if I were to write out the notes by hand in that JSON format I described, uh, it would actually be 2,081 characters. So we're talking then about 10% again. I've, I've managed to understand the structure of that piece of music. A nice thing of once you start displaying your understanding is you start being able to make changes to it in a way that makes sense to the data. So the tempo of those notes is controlled by a single piece of code. I've managed to concentrate my understanding of the fact that a beat takes a certain length of time. So if I want to for example, make it uh, a much faster tempo. I only need to change it in one place, and that's kind of a sign of the quality of my understanding. Because you don't have to just think about Kolmogorov complexity in terms of the description to return the result. You could also think of it in terms of transitions between different kinds of data. So there's something called conditional Kolmogorov complexity, where you start with a piece of data, you do something to it, and you produce the end result. So that kind of tells you how much you have to move to get from what you had to what you want. So in the case of playing this much faster, I just had to change one character. Oops, but I also need to reevaluate the form. Let me do that. Right, so I've just changed it in one place, and that shows that my code is an understanding of it. Now, just because this is strange loops, so everyone wants everything to have a, a theoretical basis. This is a, a paper by David Meredith, which I really enjoy. So he's using Kolmogorov complexity to help him in his work as a musicologist. So the big, well, one of the big insights in this paper for me, which is called Analysis by Compression, um, is that you can compare two ways of describing the same piece of music based on how long the descriptions are. So if we say that a description exploits the structure of a piece of music, then the shortest description is the one that uh, that exploits the structure the most, so it understands it the best. So there's been quite a tradition in musicology of an analyzing music in certain ways, like explaining certain structures and patterns in the notes. Uh, but this, using a, a program to output the music and comparing the length of it actually gives you a quantitative way of comparing two different ways of understanding the music. The other insight, which I actually maybe think is even more interesting, is that uh, Meredith talks about the process of listening to music as a process of model formation. So you could see a song as a process of explaining itself. You know, songs have introductions, they develop, things get broken down and put back together. So when you look at a piece of music, or when you experience a piece of music, you don't hear the whole thing at once, right? What you hear is you hear it incrementally over time. It's kind of a streaming model formation process. So your understanding of it increases over time. You might hear a certain beat to start with, that gives you a clue about how fast it is, then you might get a certain bass line which tells you what key it is, and then you gradually develop it. So what he talks about is the psychological effect of music on you is one of model formation, is the way he, he talks about it. And you can also see that as uh, a special case of conditional Kolmogorov complexity. So given I've heard this much of the song, how much kind of fitting of the concept into my head do I need to do to make sense of the next section? And you kind of know that songs are quite careful about how they do this. So not all genres of music introduce new ideas at the same rate. But they all have to take that into account. So some genres may be, you know, free jazz might be very quick in how, how much it invents new concepts and how, much, how quickly it wants you to revise your model of what the song is in your head. Other genres may be, you know, dance music that are designed to be enjoyed while, you know, while dancing away at a club. They have a slower rate of change. 
Now, that's not to imply there's a hierarchy in terms of rates of change, certainly not, because then I guess white noise would be the ultimate in musical expression. <laughs> but it's just a way of understanding it, and it gives you kind of a real basis for getting to grips with this. So, you know, my, my feeling is that I'm a programmer, I write code for a living. So if I can use the way that code works to help me understand something else, it really gives me kind of leverage and, and helps me find new insight and joy. Um, I want to show something else as well, like as, as just an example, something called uh, clapping music. Because if the process of model formation, which is really, in a way, you stating musical ideas in your own universal Kamograf language, then how well you're able to incorporate the ideas into you depends on how well the concepts in the music fit your mental language. You know, if you've chosen a language to compress data that understands the concepts of the data really well, then you'll be able to compress it really well. If it doesn't understand those concepts, then it's going to have a harder time. So clapping music, which you can see as a paragraph here, excuse me, <coughs> uh, is a piece by Steve Reich, a minimalist piece. So hopefully the code explains how this structure works, but I'm going to read it for you as well. So there's something called an African bell pattern, which is a traditional uh, rhythm used in, in a lot of sub-Saharan African music. What clapping music is, is you take the bell pattern and you loop it forever to start with, and you, you make that one part. Then what you also do is you use the concept of the canon. <coughs> so you accompany the first part with a transformation of itself. But this time, it's a little bit more complicated than row, row, row your boat. So rather than just translate it in time and play it later, it keeps falling further and further behind. So the first time it's in unison, but then it slips after eight bars, falls further behind, falls further behind. So I'll, I'll play you what I mean. Right, so it's in unison now. And it's going to slip out of time. Right, so you can hear one of the clips is now out of time. So it's the same rhythm, but it's delayed. And so this piece consists of basically this simple concept of this one rhythm and two things just falling further and further out of time. So it's actually a really good candidate for describing things in musical notation because, sorry, not musical notation, in Lisp, because I can describe these things as a process. I have one pattern and then I repeat it. It's actually quite a brief thing. But in musical notation, I don't have that same expressive power in music notation, that's just like, uh, you know, Bach's notes, uh, I'd have to kind of write it out literally. I could maybe do repeats, but I can't really capture the spirit of it. And it gets more and more extreme the more interesting structures that are in a piece of music. You just don't want musical notation to be burdened by having all that expressive power. It's not designed for that. But uh, obviously Lisp is. Um, I probably should also mention one other thing that David Meredith's paper does explore, which is the way that he uses his programming ability to decode music is by looking for geometric translation. So you can probably just see a little bit up in that corner there. He's rendered the notes as points, and then he's looking for when the same series of points occurs multiple times throughout the piece, which is actually quite a good way of analyzing Bach's music, where they'll be the same theme that will occur multiple times. Sometimes it'll be translated, so it might be you know, uh, higher or lower or extended or compressed. But this kind of analysis can help do that. And David Meredith actually has an automated process for doing that. So he's, um, he's experimenting with actually taking a piece of music as a graph and then, um, and then working from that to form the code. But what I'm going to be focusing on today is the reverse process. So the process of creating music by creating these structures and descriptions and, and showing how it makes it really uh, a really expressive way to, to get to where you want to go. Uh, and just as an incidental thing, you know, clapping music is quite minimal. The characters to describe it are only 228, uh, but if I were to write it out longhand using the JSON notation, uh, it would almost be 100,000 characters. So that shows that it's really not complex in the literal sense. Now again, I want to stress that this isn't a hierarchical description, so the fact that it's a really beautiful idea that can be expressed succinctly, I think, is actually the beauty of it. And actually, in a way, this could be a, a method for talking about minimalism more formally. It's a minimalist idea because I can describe it really briefly. There's actually a nice kind of confluence to that. It's not just a coincidence, it's something about minimalism itself that attempts to uh, compress ideas to, to a, really, a, a really small set. So I want to 
change tack a little bit because as I started to explore this idea that I could show my understanding of something by writing a really nice short program to express it, I started thinking of kind of all the tricky things you could do with this. So the Library of Babel is a short story by Borges. And this Library of Babel is a, a fictional library, or at least I imagine it to be fictional. And it consists of rows upon rows of books. Most of those books are nonsense. It's right? just gibberish of text. Every now and again, there'll be a book that the first half of it, for example, is like the Bible, and the second half just goes back to the gibberish. So what this library is, is basically a library of all possible books. So on the shelves everywhere, there's books, every variation upon text that can fit into 410 pages is present somewhere in the library. So of course it has to be quite large, but not infinite. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that the difficulty then turns towards looking up the book that you want. Uh, so of course you know the library has everything. It has, you know, it has tomorrow's newspapers in it, it has the Bible, it has, uh, it has the short story in which the library is described, present in it many times in many different forms with all possible different type, typos. So I quite, found it quite an interesting concept. It's, it's again along the, the lines of the kind of the minimalism that, that Steve Reich showed that Borges was able to come up with a really succinct description of a really expansive thing. But the reason, reason I want to mention it is that there's a really strong paradox there, which is that um, simple things can actually be supersets of complicated things, right? So there are things inside that library that are far more complex, far more detailed than even the short story that describes it. So you can create a description that expands out into something very large, and that very large thing can contain things that are much more complex. So I found that quite, quite an interesting concept, that you could have a small description that could describe things that are more complicated than itself. Of course, you just have to know where to look. So I'm going to write the Library of Babel in closure. So I'm going to start by writing the Clean Star, which you probably know from your days wrangling regexes. Um, so basically what this does, it takes a list of elements and the way that it, work, it comes up with its library is it takes a lazy sequence of the list of elements um, and then it appends to that independently all the different characters it has. So it, it produces all possible strings based on its input. So you could, you could put the four characters of DNA in here. Right? And if you did, you would generate at some point the DNA of everyone in this room. You, know, you would generate all the DNA codes that we were shown on the first day of the museum. You would generate that string of a billion Gs would be in there as well, as it happens. And so what I'm going to supply to it is basically ASCII codes. So what I'm doing is generating all possible, you know, all possible ASCII strings. Uh, so it's a bit boring to start with. So the first five um, are just like the blank string and the string with just a space and the string with an exclamation mark, etc. Um, and eventually, um, it expands. So the 364, 645th string um, is the string GB, right? Which might mean something to some of you who are coming to Strange there. And of course, this is not random, right? So unlike Borges's library, this one isn't finite, so it's actually far more expansive than Borges's one. He, he talks about there being a limit of size of each book. So you could eventually enumerate all the strings up to 410 pages, uh, and once you got there, you'd know you were done. So this will continue forever. But if I just take the first 10,000, um, you can see that it's, it's not very random at all, because I'm able to describe this library, this library of Babel, using not very many characters, and of course, it's infinite. So if you were to take the compression ratio of it, it would actually be infinitely small of, of everything because I've described an infinite structure with a finite description. Good. So the idea of having a simple description that talks about a very complex thing uh, is quite, I think, a cool idea. So before I, I get further into following that, I just want to describe something from, from this novel that I found quite interesting. So Carl Sagan's Contact was originally an attempt to write a film that, that founded, and he turned it into a novel, which eventually became a film. Uh, so it got, the, it got there in the end. But there's a lot of interesting things to this novel, especially about what interpretation means and what people who don't share our cultural context or any frame of reference would, would find the same. And uh, 
I guess a lot of it is uh, maybe connected with, with some of the universality of the, uh, the lambda calculus things that, that Phil was talking about yesterday. But one of the really nice details of this book is about pi. So pi can be described, right? It, it can't be described with an equation, so it's called transcendental because that means it transcends algebra. We have to define a process for it. So it's a little bit tricky, but you can define pi as, as an infinite sequence. So what Carl Sagan posits in contact is that once we as a civilization evaluate pi to far enough along, it will cease to appear random, right? There won't just be, you know, 177639, whatever. Kind of the static will clear and there'll actually be a message there, right? Which, which is, I thought, a really nice bit of science fiction because it, it, it talks about the idea that there might be someone who can, can communicate with us at the level of manipulating the natural laws of the universe itself. Um, so we don't, I think the other nice thing about it is it is reasonably mathematically accurate, right? We, it's probably not true, but we don't know for sure, as it happens, that much about pi. We know it's not rational, so we know it doesn't cycle ever, but we suspect there could be some weird stuff in there, so that could include a message that we come across one day. Um, as it happens, most mathematicians think that it is something like the Tower of Babel, so a, a lexicon, so that eventually it'll have all finite strings somewhere in there. Uh, so we can probably operate on that basis, but it hasn't been proven yet, which is obviously the important thing in mathematics. Um, but I, I wanted to, to work out a way of maybe using pi to make music, because it you know, has all these random digits, maybe I could encode it. But this fact that I didn't knew that it didn't necessarily contain all substrings kind of bummed me out. I thought that would be an interesting aspect to the, the piece of music. Um, so I switched to something called the Champenown word, which does have that property. So the Champenown word um, is basically just a serialization of all the integers. So fairly easy to define. It was defined actually in an undergraduate thesis. So uh, if we take, actually let's take a bit more than that. If we take the first you know, 116 characters, of the Champanan word, um, you can see that it starts by just counting. One, two, three, four. When it gets to 10, all it does is splits them out. So one, zero, one, 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 two. So this is also a transcendental number. Uh, well, it is if you interpret it as a, as a decimal fraction. And it does contain everything in it, right? So any, any string of numbers that you want, you can just wait till that number comes along and gets serialized. So we know that it has all the numbers in it. We know it's a lexicon. So that's kind of a cool property to have. Um, and one of the reasons why it's a cool property is that we can design a lexicon song, right? So if we decode this number in the right way, we know that we're going to hit every other, every other song eventually, right? Um, so one thing that, it's strange that, that, I don't know, maybe sometimes disappoints me is that people just aren't practical enough. So there's all these talks about, you know, like building lisps and stuff. I mean, there was one, there were, I, I, sh I shouldn't lie, there was definitely one very practical one about, you know, revolutionizing the, the knitting industry via, uh, via machine printed dojas. But most of the talks kind of were just about learning and stuff, which is, you know, obviously not great for us who are, you know, programmers who are really just thinking about return on investment of our time. Um, so, so I didn't want to be one of, one of them, one of you. Um, <laughs> What I, what I wanted to do was show that this is actually something quite practical. So I've made this song that actually, and I'll show you the copyright infringement song, I call it, for reasons that will become obvious. Um, so what it does is it skips to a particular part in this song, and you'll see why we need this skip to in a minute. Um, and then it decodes it into three parts, puts it in a particular tempo and plays it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play the song itself from scratch to start off with. Uh, and you'll see why we need the skip to. Right, this is probably not the most beautiful point in the song. Right, it's, it's three voices that are just doing chaotic things. Eventually, these things will go all through po all possible notes and come around to all possible three-part songs, right? So it, it's a lexicon for songs. But it's, it kind of is charming in itself, but it, it's not particularly musical. Um, so the, the point is that if we can skip to a particular point in it, we can find the kind of the bits in it that are really quite good, right? Um, so what I've chosen is I've chosen the song Blurred Lines because it was embroiled in its copyright controversy of its own. Um, and before I go too far into that, just as a detour, um, 
the kind of the haha -ha only serious misogyny in, in blurred lines is kind of makes it a particularly good target for something having gone wrong with it legally. Um, and if you want an antidote to me having cited it, uh, have a look in the references for the talk and there's a, there's a really nice uh, send up of what co called defined lines by the law review girls in, in a New Zealand uh, university. So uh, definitely don't take this as, a, as an endorsement by mentioning it. But what I have here is I have the point in the song where I found blurred lines. Um, uh, you might know that Blurred Lines had its own its problem with Marvin uh, Gaye's estate. So there was, a, there was a, uh, an idea that it actually copied a Marvin Gaye song. I'm, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that too much. Uh, but it doesn't have to be subjective. So if we were able to represent both of them using this musical notation, we'd be able to get to the point where we could actually you know, evaluate the conditional common graph complexity of the two. So you'd be able to say how different one song is from another. Um, but I might just, because this is all about demonstrations, I might just skip to that part of the copyright infringement song uh, where Blurred Lines is. And uh, the reason I have to skip is that uh, I don't think just waiting to get there would be a good idea. <laughs> because there would be, well, there'd be a couple of practical reasons. One, one thing would go wrong would be that we'd get kicked out of this room. Another problem would be that the sun would expand and destroy the earth. <laughs> Uh, and this would all happen long, long, long before we got anywhere near where this, where this is. So the skip ahead is definitely an important feature. But let's just listen to it. So it's not exactly blurred lines. It's probably, it's probably close enough for, for the legal point of view. But this is just part of an infinite song that has nothing about blurred lines anywhere in the song itself. I've just skipped to the point in it where this happens. Right? Totally blameless, right? Um, but each time it goes round, it won't exactly be the same. So it sounds kind of to you like it's a loop, but that's because we're just in a bit where this thing occurs in very similar ways over and again, right? So there's a slightly different note at the end there. Right. And the reason why I wanted to talk about practicality is, uh, well, it's, the, it's the kind of the copyright issue, right? So on one hand, um, this song does, I guess, infringe on the copyright of all previous music, which is, I guess, a problem from a legal point of view. Because <laughs> it has blurred lines in it, it does have Mark and Marvin Gaye's song in it, so it has both of them, as it happened. Uh, but the really like, important bit is that every future piece of music infringes on its copyright. <laughs> uh, so, so, so my bet is that, on balance, that will leave me in, uh, in the black, but we'll, we'll, we'll see about it. <laughs> Um, just while I get the chance, I want to give an honourable mention to Ortecker's uh, album Anti, um, or EP, uh, because they kind of had similar ideas about messing about with complexity and, and, and protest. So, uh, in 1994 in the UK, there was a, a minority, well not a minority government, a government with a thin majority, uh, and things weren't going for it so well in the polls, so coincidentally, uh, there was a moral panic that they needed to address. Right? Um, and in that, this particular case, one of the aspects to it was raves, you know, youth going off and like dancing and stuff. And this was obviously something that needed to be cracked down on. But the problem was that it's kind of hard to define, like what is a rave and what isn't. Um, so uh, the law actually quite cleverly talked about it as a succession of repetitive beats. Um, so this is, I guess, how you could differentiate between people raving and, you know, respectable people just doing Morris dancing or whatever. Um, so what, what Orteca did is they created this album. So two of these uh, tracks on this album come with like a warning that they have repetitive beats and so you shouldn't like play it in a field with your, with your mates, right? <laughs> but the third song, it doesn't. So the third song deliberately has no repetitive beats. Every beat is unique, so it keeps on cycling. So it's kind of, it's not exactly a formal lexicon. Um, and it, it does come with a warning so it says that if you are going to play this track, Flutter, which just has all these unique beats, um, you should make sure you have both a lawyer and a musicologist present to show that, that you aren't actually in infringement of the law. <laughs> but I thought it was a really charming thing to do. All right, so I want to end this by doing a bit of actual kind of more playing of music this time, something that I've come up with just to, to, to round it off. So we've talked about the idea of a canon, which is a piece of music that is accompanied by itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to make a canon out of the letters G, E, B. And I'm going to do it by following the theme of this talk, right? So we said that Kamal of complexity is about the dichotomy between the description and the result, 
So what I'm doing is I'm interpreting the notes as GEB on the scale, you probably know them, and also via their ASCII codes with a bit of type punning and just playing them as well. So I'll show you how that, uh, how that sounds. Whoops, just let me... So just let me stop it. I just need to get rid of something first. I'll just start with it simple. So the reason I wanted to build up this is I want to make the point about the psychological model formation that David Meredith talks about, right? So you're gradually learning what this song is about, right? The song itself is an explanation of what it is, you could say. So what we're doing now is just setting the scene. So I'm playing the, the notes G, E, and B, both as ASCII codes and as the little, literal notes G, E, B. And I'm, I'm putting a bit of a bass thing underneath it so that it's well defined. So what I'm going to gradually do is introduce new elements, and as this happens, you're going to gradually understand more about what the song is. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, putting like a riff in, which is going to enhance your model because we're going to move from just having the bass harmonies to something that's playing around with those harmonies. Notice that because I'm expressing this as code, every time I make a change, it's true I'm kind of slightly cheating by having typed some things before, but I'm just iterating on my model, and I'm just playing that model over and over on the loop. And so the process of me creating this is, is actually mirrored in the process of you understanding it. So let's, um, let's enhance it a bit more, or maybe well, after one more time round, so it sounds nice and even. Alright, so the last iteration. Next time around, we're going to put a kind of a, a melody on top of it, and you're going, to, you're going to feel your understanding of what it is develop. What I'm using here is a little bit similar to the Steve Reich technique, so I want to, I've described something quite simply, but I've got it falling out of time with the main tempo, and that kind of makes it sound more complex to you because you're not very good at listening. Well, no offence, you're almost certainly no good at listening to that kind of polyrhythm. What often happens in both kind of talks and, and, and everything else is that you want to approach the thing from another angle. Right? You, you, you've got to the point where you understand a little bit about it, but you're going to approach it from another angle so that you understand it a bit better. Okay. Right, so this is just a variation. So we're using different chords, we're using the same instruments, we're using the same tempo, the same kind of idea. But now you just, oh, okay, hearing it from a different angle. But the thing is that like a speaker who digresses and talks about things from a, from a completely different angle, you've only got a limited amount of time to tie it back to the, the main theme before, uh, before the audience loses their, their interest, right? Alright, and so what I want you to do is hear how these ideas join together. Alright, so we're going back to the main theme and you're hearing the alternate theme over. And so you've now got a new understanding, hopefully it's kind of a, a nice moment of pleasure there. Right? Uh, put all the bits together now. It should almost probably make sense, but you wouldn't have been able to hear this in the same way at the start, right? If I just started playing in the middle of this, you wouldn't have heard it right. Just put a bit of an effect on it, just to, to vary it again. It's the same thing, but just you hear it from a slightly different angle. Right? But I've only been able to play you this because I, I gradually led your model formation to this point. So I talked about this being a canon, right? Um, there's another dimension I want to make. So normally canons have two iterations of the same theme. What I want to do is I want to do it with three. Right? Let's turn another, another one kind of spinal tap style. So we've talked about the, the description, we've talked about the result. So what I'm going to talk about is, is what those letters mean as well. So this is in a way another canon, right? We've got another layer of meaning, and it's expressing the same the same theme in three different in three different senses. Schedule. Azure. Uh, of course, Fuck. my point is that 
uh, that music depends a lot on your context and that includes your culture. So I'm going to add some distortion to it, uh, which uh, might mean different things to, to your grandparents than you. But uh, in, in my culture, it, uh, it, uh, it means Edward. rocking out. Yeah, sure. Well, I'd say maybe a bit more.